Hello and welcome to Credit Matters TV. I'm Jeff Sexton and today I'm joined by Jonathan Noose and Stephen Lynch for a discussion of mortgage servicing rights or MSRs and the role they're playing on financial institutions balance sheets. Jonathan and Stephen, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks Jeff. Thank you. Jonathan, I'm going to start with a question for you. How are interest rates impacting mortgage servicing rights and what does that mean for the role they're playing on bank balance sheets? Sure Jeff. Well as mortgage uh, interest rates have climbed over the last five months, and they've really climbed a, a significant amount, over 100 basis points. What we've seen is that mortgage banking revenues and earnings have taken a hit. Um, refinancing applications are down uh, over 60%. Now, there is a bright spot to this picture, Jeff. The values of mortgage servicing rights, uh, which sit on the balance sheets of many financial institutions, actually move in the same direction with interest rates. So as rates rise, the speed of prepayment slows, and that actually extends the duration of the underlying cash flows uh, and in effect increases the value of these assets. Based on the review that we've done in the second quarter of 2013, um, higher rates have caused MSRs to increase by nearly 11 to 18 percent for the large banks and by about 9 to 14 percent for some of the non-banking uh, 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 financial institutions. As rates seem to be in an upward path, we expect that MSR values will continue to rise, creating a, a quite uh, nice offset, albeit a, pro a partial offset, against um, the hits on, on, on mortgages. Stephen, bringing in you now, let's talk a little bit more about those earnings for U.S. financial institutions. What role, could you talk a little bit more about the role MSRs played within those earnings and what may be affecting that role? Sure. Uh, what's most important as far as what they do to earnings is the accounting treatment. Uh, most companies we see follow mark-to-market -market accounting. So when valuations go up, we see a non-cash mark-to-market gain on the balance sheets. Now companies that use lower cost to market, they won't recognize uh, uh, the mark-to-market -market gain on the accounting state, but nonetheless, the economic value is still there. So while we will make adjustments to mark-to-market -market accounting to lower cost to market accounting so we can compare companies on an apples-to-apples -apples basis, both companies will benefit from the economic value of the MSRs going up, which improves asset liquidity and, and the value of the overall balance sheet. Jonathan, is there anything you want to add to that? I think from the large bank perspective, there's a lot of economic hedging activity that takes place. Uh, so in effect, if a bank uses uh, derivative instruments, the higher rates are actually creating a loss on those derivative uh, uh, instruments, offsetting the rise in MSR values. And so, uh, as an example, although for Wells Fargo, uh, in the second quarter, MSRs grew by nearly $2.2 billion, the net effect of the earnings which they recorded was only about $68 million. Uh, we expect uh, that as rates continue to rise, some uh, banks may be contemplating reducing some of these economic uh, hedging activities in order to boost up their earnings. Let's talk about a little bit more about the large banks and what we just said with their possibility of reducing these assets on their balance sheet. With the Basel III capital rules pending, um, how could that affect bank strategy when it comes to MSRs? Sure. Well, U.S. Basel III rules were finalized a couple of months ago. Uh, they become fully effective by 2018. Now the rules disallow a portion of MSRs from being included in Tier 1 uh, common equity. Um, the amount that, that's disallowed is actually the amount that exceeds 10% of that number. Um, and there's also an aggregate uh, limitation of 15% when MSRs are included with other assets. Now as MSRs rise because of rising interest rates, uh, the risk of brushing up against those uh, limitations actually increases as well. And so banks have to be very conscious of, of managing these assets, which is what they're doing now. Um, we believe that uh, although there is time, some banks may be uh, more inclined to sell some, uh, some of these MSR assets to non-bank financial institutions. So Stephen, bringing you back in now, let's talk a little bit more about what we do here at Standard & Poor's in the bigger picture. What could MSRs mean for our ratings on financial institutions in the U.S.? Well, if the migration happens that Jonathan is just referring to of MSRs going from banks to financial institutions, uh, it would benefit the financial institutions um, to the extent that it provides more servicing uh, UPB, um, unpaid principal balance, and MSR assets for the company. But really what will come down to is a factor of how much are they paying for the MSRs from the banks, uh, how long will, the, will these assets last, 
uh, Jonathan referred to prepayment speeds, our amortization of the asset, and also there will be a premium on how low cost of servicing operations can be so these financial institutions can protect their profit margin um, over the life of the asset. Great. With that, I'd like to thank you both for joining us with this discussion of MSRs and interest rates and what they may mean for U.S. financial institutions. From all of us here at Standard & Poor's, thank you and take care.